Wonderful. Okay, well, uh, it is evening here in South Africa, but I think it's other times of day everywhere else, so good time of day to you wherever you may be. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a little bit of work that I've been doing on the threat of impact structure. Now, this is the Planetary Crater uh, Consortium meeting. I want to uh, just mention the planet that I'm going to be discussing is Earth. Um, when we zoom in on Earth a little bit, um, there are about 200 confirmed impact craters on Earth, and that includes all craters of all different sizes. Now, um, of those, there's really three that are considered the largest that are often considered something like basin-sized impact events, which are the Chicxulub structure in Mexico we were just hearing about, the Fredofort structure in South Africa, and the Sudbury structure in Canada. Um, so when we zoom in on South Africa, we can see right in the middle of South Africa, you have this large zone that in the middle of it, there's a bullseye, and that is the Fredofort impact structure just south of Johannesburg. And the Fredofort structure sits in the middle of the uh, Witwatersrand and gold fields, uh, which account for about 40% of the gold that's ever been mined in the history of humanity. So uh, Fredofort has a little bit of economic significance. Now, the full scale of the structure is not uh, entirely agreed upon, but most estimates put it in the neighborhood of about 300 kilometers diameter. Now the middle portion of the Vredefort structure is what's received the most attention and study. This is often called the Vredefort Dome because it is a topographic dome. And this is the area where we preserve the evidence of high shock uh, events and a little bit of the impact melt. Now uh, Vredefort uh, struck the earth probably about uh, two billion years ago, a little over two billion years ago, and despite the fact that it originally had a diameter of 300 kilometers, it has been deeply eroded. We believe that there's been about 10 kilometers of erosion that have taken place, so that we have a modern topographic profile uh, where in the central parts of the structure we have um, mainly crystalline uh, basement rocks, granites, uh, that make this structural dome. And then on the collar of that, we have upturned uh, metasediments and metavolcanic rocks. Now indicated in black here are nine different melt dikes. There's four of them that are highlighted. These are the granifier dikes. And that's really going to be the focus of what we're going to talk about here. There's innumerable things that are worth studying at Bredefort, but I find the granifier dikes to be quite interesting. You see, when Vredefort first formed, it would have been an impact basin. The Archean basement rocks were uplifted so that these granites were brought near the surface, and a melt sheet would have formed across the top of the structure. But um, after that melt sheet formed, we had these melt dikes penetrate down into the crust. After that happened, there was a little bit of erosion that took place so that all we have left are these granifier dikes and we don't have any other direct evidence of what the melt sheet at Bredefort may have looked like. So we have to ask the question, how did these dikes form? What were the mechanisms that allowed these to form, be in place, how was this melt derived from the melt sheet, and what can this tell us about the impact basin development? So if we look at one of these uh, melt dikes, this is the Lesotho Kral Granifier Dike, and we see that um, it is a few meters wide. Uh, these are not terribly wide dikes, but they do extend for uh, often several kilometers. You can see a bunch of little bumps up here along this uh, upper edge of this image. This is an ortho photo of the dike. Um, and those are inclusions within the dike. Now, those uh, inclusions in the dike are not present all the way through, and we don't find them homogeneously through the dike. What we do find is that where those inclusions are present, and we find this on many of the dikes, they are uh, often, the elongate ones are elongate parallel to the extension of the dike, so that these look as though they are flow aligned, and we often find features where there are clasps that look like they should have been elongate clasps, that have been twisted around. And in this case, this one's actually twisted into a spiral um, by the emplacement mechanism. Here's another one that the clasp has been folded in half. Uh, 
Um, but we find these vary heterogeneously through the dikes. Um, when we look at the ground mass of these dikes, um, they're made of uh, mainly a ground mass of pyroxene and feldspar. So we have these elongate pyroxene needles and the spherulitic texture of feldspar um, beneath that. And intermixed with that, there's a lot of these clasts. Now those clasts have the compositions, uh, quartz uh, clasts are the most common that we see, but there are compositions of basically all of the lithologies that would have formed the upper parts of the stratigraphy of uh, the Bradford impact site. So these serve as xenoliths that are being transported by the dike but being transported down rather than being transported up as we would normally see in geological processes. So these are, are uh, messengers from the eroded surface. And one thing that we see with a lot of these quartz inclusions is that these are, um, they have a granular texture as though they have been made molten and been uh, quenched or, or recrystallized without being disaggregated or incorporated within the melt. And we see that a lot of these pyroxene needles are actually growing through these quartz clasts. So obviously the pyroxene wouldn't be growing into a competent quartz grain, so the quartz must have been uh, fairly plastic or molten at the time that the pyroxene was growing. Um, so we decided we wanted to study these uh, inclusions in more detail. So we went to uh, this dike is the Daskop Granifier Dike, which is also in the core of the impact structure. And uh, you can see that it's made up of a bunch of boulders. And some of the uh, some of the parts of the dike seems to have a lot of these clasts, other parts of the dike not so many. So we decided to map that. So what we did, we walked along the dike and on each individual boulder we gave it a score of the uh, visual percentage of clasts that we could see within the boulder. And then we flew drones over the dike and uh, compiled the 3D model that you just saw, as well as this ortho photo that's uh, the top image. We outlined each of the boulders and then assigned it the percentage of clasts. And what you can see is that we have these zones where there's high class abundance, which is greater than 10% of the mass that we could see, uh, or the volume that we could see was made of clasts. And then we have these zones with not so many clasts. Now what we noticed is that the class rich portions tended to be on the southern margin of the dike. And even um, we have uh, one edge of the dike where it cuts back and almost like a conjugate fracture type of uh, scenario. And that's where we found the highest abundances of clasts. So then this left us with um, a little bit of a question. How do we have this heterogeneous distribution? What processes can explain this type of heterogeneity that we're observing within these dikes? So we thought uh, maybe naively we can have a simple answer to this. We have more clasts on one side of the dike than the other side, so maybe the dike is tilted and it is simple gravitational settling. The clasts fell to the bottom. So we went with our colleague, uh, this is Francois Fourier, uh, who performed electrical resistivity measurements of the dikes for us. Um, and we did uh, electrical resistivity measurements at four dikes, the Hallfontein, Lesotho, Crawl, and Daskop dikes are all in the granitic core of the structure. And then we went to the collar where there's this contact between the granites and the metasediments. And we looked at one of the dikes that was there to see what's going on in the near subsurface with these dikes. So what we found is this. So if we look at the core dikes, which is, here's the Hallfontein, Daskop, and Lesotho Crawl dikes, we see this patch of red uh, material right up at the surface. That highly resistive material represents the granophyre dikes. These disappear less than five meters below the present day erosional surface. So we were going there to look for the dip. It turns out there is no dip because they just don't go into the subsurface. However, when we went to the collar dike, we saw that it extended down as far as we could see. So we see that there's some kind of distinction going on between the core dikes and the collar dikes. So gravitational settling is not an adequate explanation for how we're getting these class distributed this way um, for a variety of reasons. So we thought, well, maybe it's a temperature difference 
we did a little bit of um, modeling of the thermal properties of the granophyre dikes and the, the quartz inclusions. We found that in some ideal conditions, maybe it would be possible for assimilation of clasts to give you some kind of distinction between uh, clast rich and clast poor types of areas, but this was not a satisfactory answer because we don't have any mechanism that could really explain this. What we did think about though, is that if you have uh, two immiscible uh, compositions of liquids that are flowing in a tube, then you might wind up with these kinds of flow properties. This is some uh, modeling that was done on oil and water flowing through pipes a few years ago. Um, but uh, if we have classed rich melt and classed poor melt that are flowing in the same narrow fracture, then perhaps you would get these types of turbulent flow characteristics where if you were to um, make a cross section through the flow at any given point, you might see that there's more of the immiscible fluid on one side or the other side. So uh, this is the type of model where we think that maybe these rapid flow characteristics that are rotating these clasts and allowing this rapid em emplacement to take place might be explaining what we're seeing with the class distribution. So we think the model might look something like this, that uh, we can have the uh, material flowing through these fractures after the melt sheet has formed and the material starts to flow down into the crust. Um, material is broken off of the wall rock. And then because we have turbulent flow, some of the clasts are pushed to one side or the other side. And then we see a particular dike we only see the clasts on one side. But this doesn't answer our fundamental question about why these fractures are opening in the first place. So we, go, we went back to the collar dike, the one that we saw in the resistivity profile was extending down much more deeply and we started looking at it in more detail. What we saw is that there are actually two compositions there. We don't observe this in the core dikes we see that there's this contact phase that's in the melt rock from the impact that's in contact with the host material. And then inside of that, we see this other intrusive melt that actually has inclusions of the earlier intruded melt. So this looks like it's a second emplacement event. When we measure the geochemistry of that, we find that all of the, um, all of the dikes that we've ever measured, they fall within a pretty restricted compositional field, except this material is more mafic than anything else we've ever measured. We also saw this when we looked at the compositions of the pyroxenes. So when we looked at the core dikes, they plotted down in, in this uh, very calcium depleted field. When we looked at the contact, the, the first emplacement event of this collar dike, we find that that now, uh, pyroxene compositions overlap entirely. But when we looked at the pyroxenes from the other phase, what we find is that those are much more calcium rich. The fields are completely different. We're seeing a different composition that's being emplaced. So how can that happen? Well, this is very reminiscent of uh, the Sudbury example where we have the quartz bearing diorite and the inclusion bearing quartz diorite, where we have this evidence of um, clasts that are ripped up from an earlier emplacement event. And so it begins to look like maybe what we have is two different cuts of the same um, melt dike system, that we have the Sudbury offset type dikes preserved at Sudbury, and deep inside the crust we have the Vredeport system, where Vredeport is preserving the very bottom of this type of system, and we're only getting these little glimpses where the geophysical signature is disappearing and the composition, the chemical composition of the dikes seems very primitive. So this allows us to build up some kind of model that a series of events could be taking place like this. First, you have the impact occur and you have a homogenized melt sheet that forms. Fractures form in the crust then that penetrate deeply. Then that melt material is coming from essentially a homogenized melt sheet. After that happens, the melt sheet differentiates and then you extract melt again, only now you're extracting the Sudbury offset type uh, melt, which is also what we see as the secondary phase in the collar dike granophyre. Now, how do the 
fractures open in the first place. We believe, I think what we're seeing with this, it, we have to have enough time for um, the differentiation of the melt sheet to take place. So this is happening on uh, relatively long time scales compared to the impact. So after the impact occurs, we have removal of mass from the center of the impact structure, and then we begin to have isostatic uh, crustal re-equilibration that occurs so that in pulses, the, uh, the center of the impact structure is uplifted, fractures are opened in the crust, and melt material is extracted from the melt sheet and brought down. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, it looks like we don't have any questions yet. Is that correct? Uh, no, there's one that's come okay. up. Uh, yeah, so this is from Sean again. Question, given the location of the collar dikes in the ring-like shape, is there a possibility that these were localizations of slip between acoustically fluidized blocks during crater formation or crater modification? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. And I think that there's a general feeling that the um, the rheological contrast between the metasediments in the collar and the granites in the basement must have been acting as some kind of slip surface that these melts were intruding along. We've kind of ind indicated that in our diagram as well, that this is obviously a surface that's being exploited. Now, was this acoustic fluidization blocks? Um, I've had discussions with Ulrich Riller on this point. Um, he's been down to to look at some of the areas around Bradford, and um, he's not convinced that anything he's seen in the field actually looks like an acoustic fluidization block. Um, so at this point, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what to look for in the field. Uh, what would that look like in nature? I think that it's uh, the acoustic fluidization blocks, it's a very useful modeling paradigm. I don't know, and I would really appreciate if anybody could tell me uh, what we should be looking for in the field. Okay, thanks for the response. Uh, there are no further questions at the moment in the chat. Okay. Uh, Matt, I guess if you have any, um further comments about your work. We have a, a couple of more minutes. Uh, there actually are two more questions that just came in. Oh, they're, oh great. <laughs> they're longer, so I guess great. they were typing. Uh, this is from uh, Anya Losiak again. Given that you suggest there was a significant time difference between deposition of the A-type and the B-type granophyre, enough for differentiation of the, melt, of the melt sheet, how did these two pieces end up next to each other? Um, I think this is um, this is something that I've given thought to. I mean, there must be enough time for the A-type granophyre to be um, solidifying enough that it can be ripped off into an inclusion in the second uh, intrusion event. So there has to be some passage of time. Um, what I would definitely envision is going on is that once you've formed a fracture, then it is easy to dilate the existing fracture as a pre-existing plane of weakness so that you would be repeatedly exploiting the same fractures over and over again. I think in the core of the structure where we don't see these secondary um, pulses of granophyre material coming into the core dikes, I think we are below the depth that those were intruding. Uh, I think we're seeing basically the first fractures that opened and allowed the melt to go to the maximum depth. All right, the next question is from Bill McKinnon. Do you have any drill or excavation data that confirms the extreme shallowness of some of these dikes? Also, he has been to some famous quarry sections of the Vreedfort melt, and he doesn't know if there are small, if these are small as the dikes that, they're, that you're referring to, uh, but the quarry was quite deep. Okay, so I'll take those questions in the reverse order. Um, so there are two different types of impact melts that are usually studied at Bredefort, and I actually did not mention pseudotacolites at all in my talk. So all of the quarries that were mining granite in the past are quarries where there are pseudotacolite melts. 
I'm not aware of any granifier melt in any of those quarries. The difference being that the pseudotacolites are essentially in situ melt, where um, if you look at the composition of the pseudotacolites within granite, essentially they have granitic composition, whereas the granifier dikes, their composition is essentially average continental crust. Um, so it's two different melt processes. What you saw in the quarries, almost certainly a different type of melt entirely. Um, now, as for drill data, um, Vredefort, uh, large portions of it are a World Heritage Site. I would absolutely love to get a drill core drilled, and if anyone would like to help with writing a proposal on that, I'm definitely open to that idea. Um, what, what I can say is that we have hiked out in the field. Um, the Daskop dike, the one where we measured the clasts, where we actually mapped out all of the clasts, uh, that dike is sitting on top of a hill. And so the geophysics at the top of the hill predict that about uh, four to five meters down, the dike should disappear. When we walk topographically down the hill four or five meters, the dike disappears. When we walk up the hill on the next slope, um, going through the valley, um, at the topographic level where we expect the dike to show back up, it shows back up. So it seems like, you know, it's possible that the melt was not uh, intruded to exactly the same depth all the way along strike, but it seems from just walking it out that that's exactly what's happening, that, that it's just disappearing exactly where we predict it to disappear based on the geophysics. Okay, and now that's all of the questions that are in the chat again. Okay, looks like we have uh, just a couple of minutes. If Matt, you wanted to make any further comments or we could. Um, I'm not sure. I, it's, I'm, I'm always happy to talk more about these things. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we could go ahead and get started if uh, if Gunther is ready, or we could take a two minute two minute break. Uh, we oh wait, uh, one more question, real quick, has come up. Sean, again, where would you drill if you could? Um, if I could, I would put in a series of drill cores. There's quite a few things in Vredefort that are interesting. Um, the right in the middle, there's what's known as the central anatectic granite, which is probably also a post impact melt that was formed uh, that has not been studied sufficiently. With respect to the granifier, I would want to be drilling the core dikes and the collar dikes. And we actually have some locations that we've picked out um, that I, in some of the core areas where we think that we would actually hit some very interesting things including not only the granifier, but also some of the charnakites that are probably uh, from the deep crustal profile. Um, so I think we could actually hit multiple science targets with a single drill core uh, in the middle of Redifort. And then drilling through the collar rocks with any of these, uh, these collar dikes, I don't think any of them have ever been drilled below the surface. And with those, I, I there's a few locations that could be very interesting to get some profiles that would be never before seen type of things that could have a lot of implications about how this impact melt is developing. <laughs> 